You should know I'm always talking about You should always know that Mary Ellen has my personal cell phone. I know that's exactly what I do. Like, I do today. Um, I think we're ready to get going. And a uh, um, huge thank you to um, the ADRC folks, Amy, uh, Ryan, and uh, Jana. Where did Jana go? Oh, Jen? she, 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 she ran, ran out. out. Okay, Jennifer Jana at ADRC. Um, uh, Jana Marion. There she is, right there. She heard me call her name with Compassus. Uh, thank you. And Christine back here also with Compassus. And then um, Colette. Colette, and what's your last name? Zunk. Zunk, um, and she's with Marshfield Hospital, is that correct? Marshfield, Marshfield Medical Center. Marshfield Medical Center, and uh, thank you to everybody who uh, is coming to help provide resources. We 
Uh, we're very thankful for everyone who uh, came to the first uh, installment of this. We're glad to see so many of you back and even some new faces as well. I'm Pastor John Rath, and I'm pastor here at uh, Peace Lutheran Church. Uh, welcome to our congregation and for this uh, event that we hope will be a blessing to you. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given to us and the opportunities you've given, it to, given us to enjoy it in this uh, beautiful place, the North Woods. We thank you also for time to sit down together today, Lord, and uh, think about the future, uh, things that we don't know about, but that you certainly do. We pray your blessing upon the presentations today, Lord, that these will help all the participants grow in, well, planning ahead. And we thank you, Lord, for your work to care for us, no matter how good or bad things are going through your son, Jesus Christ. Continue to bless all of us with the comfort of his love as our good shepherd and enduring faith in him, his love, forgiveness, and life, and a heavenly home for us. Bless now this presentation, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All, right. all right. Well, while you're getting collected. Um, oh, no, you decided not to use the mic. I'm going to no. try not. Okay, so I just want to say um, thank you to Pastor and to the church for having us. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am Amy Ryan with the Aging and Disability Resource Center of Vilas County. Um, so I'm very excited to have Colette here. Colette and I have worked for more years than I want to admit because <laughs> I won't tell you at my age. Um, and she is one of, she's been in discharge planning is what I've mainly known you in, and palliative care, and now you're over at the Marshfield Medical Center. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna have Colette talk for a little bit. There is, for the folks that are on video land, we're gonna be using a PowerPoint. If you want the PowerPoint, um, just email the church office and Chris and I will get it to you. Um, and then after um, Colette's presentation, if people wanna look over their documents, wanna fill out documents, we have folks available to do that today. So thank you, welcome. So there is a little bit of a microphone here. I'm gonna try to project my voice, but if you can't hear me in the back, let me know and I'll wear the other microphone. So as Amy said, um, I've been doing social work in the Northwoods for a really long time. Um, in all of my roles, um, advanced care planning and the importance of power of attorney has always been a significant part of the work that I do. So I'm very happy to give this presentation today. I'm not sure how this works though. Oh, <laughs> push the arrow. There you go. Okay. So our talk today is about not only just the document that needs to be done, but really what encompasses an advanced care planning process. It is a document but it's, it's thinking about the future, it's communicating your wishes with your, with your loved ones and with your provider. Um, and we're gonna kind of talk about how all of that goes. I usually have one in front of me. I'm just gonna grab my cheat sheet so I don't have to keep looking behind my back. So, how many of you already have a power of attorney completed? Okay, so in one hand, we're pre preaching to the choir because 90% of you already have documents completed. But just because they're done doesn't mean you're done with it. That does often require review and our, our values and our thoughts about things change over time, the documents change. So you're all fairly educated about this process coming into this. But some of the things that we also think about when we're, a lot of people don't want to talk about this. They don't want to complete documents because they're afraid of facing what it means at the end of our life. So when we, it, it is a process, we have to kind of talk about what our, what our thoughts are, what our wishes might be, if the worst thing ever happens. And we have to kind of confront some of our fears too. 
So when, when a document has completed, as you're here today, I guess what we would like is for you to think about what the document means for you and the, the forms are, are different and there's ways of making it more um, comprehensive to express your specific wishes and preferences. So I like this one. It says, last night my kids and I were sitting in the living room and I said to them, I never want to live in a vegetative state, depend on, <laughs> on machines and fluids from a bottle. If that ever happens, just pull the plug. <laughs> So what did they do? They got up, unplugged the uh, computer, and threw out my wine. It's all perspective, isn't it? So when we talk about advanced care, care planning, we need a roadmap. What does it all mean? And we're just focusing on health care directives today. But advanced care planning really is this great big umbrella of all documents planning for the future. So that encompasses durable or financial power of attorney forms, um, a legal will, estate planning, do not resuscitate orders, power of attorney for healthcare. So there's a lot of different forms. It's not easy. One document doesn't encompass everything that you need. So we often need a little roadmap to kind of point us in the right direction, make sure that we have all of our ducks in a row and, and we have to work to um, work with different types of specialists too, an attorney, financial planner, and, and your healthcare providers too. <coughs> so when we talk about advanced care planning, what do people want? Well, People want certain things, but the reality is totally different. Now, these statistics are a few years old, but I think they're still um, pretty relevant. So 70% of people say that they would rather die at home, but 70% of them are dying in a facility. 60% say it's really important that their family is not burdened to take care of them, but over 50% percent of the people haven't completed any kind of directive to share what their wishes or preferences are. 80% say that they would like to talk about this with their provider, but only 7% say that they actually did talk about it with their provider. 82% say that it's important to have in writing, but only 23% have it in writing. At Marshfield Clinic, because we track these things and it's important for us, in the Minocqua area, over like 54% of our patients actually have a document on file. We have a long way to go um, yet, but that's better than some other, you know, that's better than that 23%. So how do you begin? And I, I think by being here, you're beginning. And, and having questions, um, the, the things that, that are kind of burning on your mind, that's where we start. What, what is important to you? Um, how do you feel about, and we're gonna talk more specifically on healthcare things, but what if something happened to you? Um, you all know people that have had significant health issues or had tragic things happen to them. And you've probably have thought, boy, if that ever happened to me, I would want this or this done. But have you really thought about how that might play out? I think it's it's one thing to think about something and totally something when we're facing it and it becomes a reality. Um, choose a decision maker. So that's the other really important thing that you want somebody that's, that will be your healthcare agent that's gonna be of like mind with you, that's gonna honor your wishes and your values and your feelings versus somebody who might have their own agenda. Just because the first child is the first child doesn't mean the first child is the best person to be, be speaking for you if you become incapacitated. So you really need to put some thought into it. Um, and 
really explore what what is important, what your preferences are, what does quality of life. Oh, that would be nice because I can't really do that. Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. Just don't. <laughs> Fall prevention. No, I'm. I Good. was told to stay here. I'm staying here. So, what are our values? What does that mean? It's it's our religious upbringing, and it's our family values. It's um, the things that we have um, that are morals. It's it's our beliefs. It's it's the core of who we are, and and what makes us us. Um, it's our experiences and all of the positive and negative experiences. So when you think about health care, we tend to dwell on all of the negative experiences. And we talk about all the horror, horror um, stories that are out there with things that have happened to people or whatever. We don't tend to think about all of the progress that's made or, you know, the technology changes or things like that. So it's what what does all of that mean for you? What is the ex how how does all of those experiences affect your values? So, what does end of life mean to you? I think all of us know that we're going to die someday, but when that happens, we're just going to not wake up one day. We just don't think about what that might be. And while a you actually die in their sleep or die very suddenly. Most of us develop chronic health issues and we are suffering and dwindle and, and have complications because of chronic health conditions. And it's all of that that decisions end up needing to be made. Do we do a procedure or not? Do we pursue a feeding tube or not? Do we pursue chemotherapy or not? Um, do we intubate? Do we put breathing machines on people? Do we treat with antibiotics? There's all kinds of little decisions that are made along the way when we're dealing with chronic illnesses. And we don't always think about that. We just think of the big things. Well, if, if something has happened and I'm in a coma and I'm on a machine and I'm not waking up, that's pretty black and white. I, this is how I would want decisions to be made. But what if you develop dementia and you're healthy? but you can't understand or communicate and make decisions. How would you want decisions to be made in that situation? So there's a lot of different ways to think about this. There's also your cultural, your family influences. Um, I think I've covered all of that. So this is a question that we like to pose. On a good day for you, what happens on that day? What brings you meaning and pleasure? What gives you quality? What does that day look like? I think a lot of us want that, those good days for as long as absolutely possible. So it's the people that we <coughs> surround ourselves with that helps fulfill us and give us meaning and pleasure to help us find that quality of life. But what happens when, when we can't have that in the same way that we can now because of health conditions or complications? So there's three decisions that we suggest here that we, that we will be talking about further. Who do you want to be that person that steps in for you to make decisions? What are the values and the cultural and spiritual beliefs that, that come to you? And what type of care would you want in case of a sudden or abrupt tragic situation or injury? So when we, I briefly alluded to choosing that healthcare provider, that healthcare decision maker. Um, we call it a healthcare agent on the document. So that needs to be somebody that knows that you're assigning it to them. I don't know how many times on the hospital side that we're pulling these documents out after a difficult situation and we're calling the first named agent that didn't even know that they were on the document, let alone have any conversation. And there is there is documented that um, people have post-traumatic stress from making these kind of life, life and death decisions and it's much higher because they never had a conversation. 
So it needs to be somebody that's going to accept it. And it has to be somebody that you feel comfortable with, that they share similar values and, and beliefs and, and that they're going to honor what you, what you want. And that they really have the ability to step up in stressful situations because these are not easy things. So, so once, once a healthcare, so when we complete a document, it sits dormant. You have it in a drawer at home, we have it in the medical record and we know that it's there. It should be reviewed every couple of years to make sure that it's still current and, and meets your current values. All the contact information is still current, but it's dormant. In order to activate it, the time that your named healthcare agent starts um, stepping in and being your voice, two providers have to evaluate you. They sign a document called the Statement of Incapacity. That wakes the document up, takes it out of the drawer and becomes the living, breathing document that we work on. To become incapacitated, the person has to be, have difficulty communicating, comprehending, or you know, understanding and being able to participate in their decision making. So there could be trauma, there, you know, like a significant stroke. It could be um, just age-related you know, health issues. Um, different reasons that a document is activated. But at that point, the healthcare agent's responsibility is to act on your behalf, to arrange for medical care, to agree or disagree to pursue any kind of new medication, procedure, hospitalization, surgery, whatever the case may be. It's also their responsibility to make sure that you have that you're getting medical care, that you are um, getting to appointments, that you are um, taking your medicine, that you're in a safe environment. Um, they have the authority to review your medical records and, and to communicate with all of your providers to make sure that everything is the way that it should be for you. The only thing that they can't do is admit you to a psychiatric unit because there's limitations on mental health care in the state of Wisconsin. But the, the document gives full authority to make any and all health care related decisions. Any questions about that? Yes? Yes, um, excuse me. I have a, a, a provider all set up with returning anything in the paperwork. And that book, does, does that need to be at the, uh, you know, like right now we're up here in the north. Does that need to be at one of the facilities? Does that have, that whole document need to be at a facility? Or does it just end the uh, person I've chosen? So we, we do recommend that you, if you have a completed health care directive, that a copy be on file with your medical provider. Okay. Because if something happens in, an, in the emergency or during a hospitalization or, or as things change, then we know who we're supposed to be reaching out to as we're looking at activating that document. If we don't have it, we don't know who to call. It, it's not helpful. So it is good to have it on file. So Colette, can I ask a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. So if I'm a snowbird... Mm -hmm. Oh, wouldn't that be a lovely thought? If I was a snowbird and I'm here in the summer and I'm in Florida in the winter, would you suggest I have documents at, with both yes. areas? Okay, so we recommend that you only have one document and the document should be really in your, your state of legal residence. So if you, if you, summer here, but you live full time or your legal residence is in Florida, you should have a Florida document, but bring a copy of that Florida document for your file here. The rules are different between each state. They, they don't all contain the same requirements, but there is reciprocity between the states. So the fact that you have named somebody to be your healthcare agent is what the hospitals go by. Now, I don't recommend that you have 
two, so two documents. But if you have one, it should be on file with, with all of the health systems that you go to. So even if you live here and you go to Howard Young Aspirus and Marshfield Clinic, each health system should have a copy of the document because our computers don't communicate. So it's important that, or, and if you're with the VA, then you also wanna make sure that the VA has a copy too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So as, as we're, um, so we've picked an agent, we kind of, and the document, depending on which document that we have, and we've got lots of varieties, you can name as many people as you want. Some of the documents themselves only allow for two or three people. There's only enough space to write in that. We don't recommend that you list more than two or three because the more people that you have listed, the more potential for conflict there is. But you should at least have two because what we do is we go with the first person listed. If that person becomes incapacitated themselves or is unable or unwilling to make a decision, then we go to the next person listed. If that person is unable, unwilling to make a decision, then we go to the next person listed. They don't have equal authority as far as the, the law reads. So once you've picked your people to, that you want to be your healthcare agents, the next step is to explain to them what your wishes are. And there's some, some recommendations here on your cultural and spiritual and familial beliefs and values to kind of talk about those things. What brings you comfort? What, what does that mean for you? Um, what's, where's the line in the sand that might need to be drawn? Um, I do a lot of these documents with people and there are some people who have had a lot of healthcare interventions done and they say, make sure you do this, but don't ever do this to me again. Um, so, so there's ways of spelling out what's important and, and what you really don't want. But it's whether that is written in the document, it is very important to have the conversation with your family. I recommend, you know, you, you're talking about family members, neighbors, friends, things that you see on TV, um, movies that you watch. And I, those are all talking moments. Boy, if that ever happened to me, I like how they did that. I, I would really like that, but don't ever do that for me. Now, having worked in healthcare pretty much my entire career, my kids have grown up with those kind of comments all the time. I would come home from work and say, boy, this is a situation, don't ever do that to me. Or make sure that you always consider this if anything happens to me. So it doesn't have to be a full blown, you know, conversation all of the time, but those passing comments do help your family understand what's important. And if they're ever called upon to make a decision, the ones that say, we've talked about this, while I don't always agree, I will honor my loved one's wishes because they were very clear with me on what they what they wanted. So that's really what the take home is today is the having that conversation. Excuse me, mm -hmm. I just wanna clarify something you said a little bit earlier about the number of people um, that you can name. Um, was I correct in thinking that uh, the number one person is number one and takes it 100% and only <coughs> If they become correct, a, 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 that's when you then it gets to deferred to the second one. Okay, so no, they're not like 50-50. Correct. And, and I know some attorneys write it out that way as co, but then they both have to be at the same appointment. They both have to be in the same place if they're written as co-agents. And that's physically impossible for many people. So... The, the way that it's recommended is that you have the first person and then the next people. Can, can that same person that's number one be your um, healthcare agent and your power of attorney and the other stuff? Mm -hmm. The same person can be, in, okay, you don't have to have different. Right, right. Mm -hmm. you, you just wanna make sure that whoever you choose is going to follow your wishes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if you have two children and you get along with both of them and the oldest one is like 
you know that they would never ever be able to pull the plug if you're brain dead. And their youngest one would be like, that's what mom wanted. She wouldn't want to live like this. Then you should choose the second one instead of the first. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. While you're talking about that, I just want to ask too, <coughs> if there is a family question, can that be contested? I mean, can that get drawn out or? Oh, legal battles do happen. That's why these documents are in place because of great big cases in the past with with Nancy Cruzon and, and um, I'm gonna lose all of their names now. There's like three really big cases in the, the 70s and 80s that led to the importance of these self-determination acts. That, that's why we have these documents. Um, so it can be contested because there's family squabble all the time. And that's why you have to be very careful on, on who you pick and, and that it's gonna be, even though there might be dissension within the family, you want the person named that's really going to follow your wishes. And if you're spelling out your wishes, it's pretty clear. And if that person is honoring your wishes, there really is nothing to contest because you specified what your wishes are and that person is honoring it. But if you named people and they're in disagreement, it could go to court battles at times. So... Again, just because the oldest is the oldest doesn't make sure that they're always the best person for the responsibility. I noticed uh, I have an agent that is not my children because I was advised not to uh, name children. Someone other than, what is your stance? It, to me, it doesn't matter who it is. It just has to be somebody that you trust. Um, a lot of people, so when people complete these documents on their own, what I have found is that they automatically think that their spouse is the first person, but they don't put the spouse's name on the document. And then the document gets activated and now we're calling child number one on the, the healthcare agent and the, and the spouse is like, well, why, why am I not being called? We're not a next of kin state. So unless your name is in the document, you don't have authority to make many decisions. So you have to include, do you want your spouse to be that first person? Um, I completed one recently that the, the individual did not want the spouse to be the person, did not feel that that spouse could handle the stress of making such difficult decisions and wanted somebody else. I have had people that name a friend or even their attorney or things like that as their agents because they wanted a neutral party and, and not put their kids through the stress of making decisions. So that is where your values and, and beliefs, that's, that helps with that decision making on who is the best person to speak for you. I know in large families, sometimes they will, the, the parent will choose a child, mm -hmm. but then speak to the child beforehand and say, I want you to speak with your siblings before you truly make any decision. I'm the fifth of six kids. I'm the youngest daughter. There's 21 years between the oldest and youngest in my family. My mom and dad named me as their, they named each other and then they named me as the healthcare agent. And there's, you know, it's a large family. We've got a lot of age differences. There's, there's squabbles within our family. But I considered myself the family spokesperson, so the healthcare team only had to work with one person. But I, I worked with all of my siblings to make sure that we were all on the same page. Not every family works that way. You know your family and where the dynamics are. I made sure that, that my parents shared their wishes with everybody else, so when decisions had to be made, they had already heard it from my parents. So nothing was new. So there was no disagreement when decisions had to be made because my parents talked, which is just really important. Mm -hmm. Is it smart to have a, like say, Sue and I are both each other, but say we're in a car accident together. So is it smart to have a third one or a second one as your? 
I, I do. I, I do recommend a backup. Sometimes we just don't have those people, though. I know, you know, people don't have kids. They don't have siblings or they're not close to a lot of friends that they would want to take up this responsibility on. So what happens when we don't have a document or if we have a situation where the only named agent is now incapable of making decisions, then we have to pursue guardianship. The um, lawyers become involved, the judge becomes involved. And in that case where there is nobody, then a court appointed guardian gets named to make decisions. But that's a costly and time consuming process that we like to avoid, which is it's important to do these documents ahead of time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you can always change your mind, you know, so it, it is overwhelming, you know, to think of needing to do this process. But it's like, even if you have something written down that just says, I name you as my decision maker, even if you want to add and, and take things out in the future, at least if nothing else, have it written down to appoint somebody mm -hmm. as that decision maker for you. Yeah. Which then brings up a good point. So Jim and I had done um, old forms. They, they were, the form itself was from February of 2011 and we figured we'd better do some updates because I'm sure the language has changed. So when we do a new form and we submit it then to our healthcare providers, I'm assuming then does that supersede the, the old form on Yep, there? so we always go by the newest date okay. and that, that within the verbiage of the document, it says this document overrides or supersedes any previous existing documents. Okay. And you can't go and you can't cross things off from the old right. from the old right. one right. to update it. Yeah. Yeah. So people will they will review it and then they say, oh well, these addresses are wrong and this phone number is wrong. We actually just just write down all the current new addresses. We have a form at Marshfield Clinic. I think Aspirus has a form too that's just called a demographic update. We fill that out with the current contact information. It gets attached to it. If the document itself, there's no changes, just the contact information, we don't have to do a new document. We need to do a new document if we decide that we want to name somebody else or change the order of our agents, or if we want to check different boxes within the document, then a new, new one should be done. I'll let you have one more question. How do you... Uh we submit these to, to Marshfield. Do I just march over there and say? You can leave yep, you can leave it at the front desk. You can bring it to your doctor's appointment and any anybody will get it into your medical record. Mm -hmm. Well, I leaving at the front desk seems uh, you can just say this needs to be put in my medical record and it, it gets and sent. It will yep, there okay. there's folders that, that they automatically put it into medical records to be scanned. Okay. And it can take about a week from the time that it gets routed to medical records for it to actually be scanned in. So it's we don't have scanners that do it immediately. You had mentioned that Wisconsin is not a kin. Shape. Next of kin. Next of kin. Mm -hmm. We are not. Huh? We are not. Illinois is, but we are not. Michigan is not. And I don't know about Minnesota. I should. Because um, that's where I'm from, but and I, that's where all my, my parents' stuff was, but I don't recall if Minnesota is or not. So if there's not a declaration of the order of will, then how does that work? So it, for those states that have next of kin, there's a law on the hierarchy of who can make decisions and, and how. So it's spouse and, and children and siblings and... But we do not. Either. We do not. Mm -mm. And so the determination of who is made how? If if we need guardian, mm -hmm. is that what you're asking? If yeah, we have to pursue guardian? Well, no, being next to kin. Or... If you I think you're, yeah, if so you're saying if you don't have something written down, yeah. what happens? Yeah. And you kind of mentioned the guardianship. Yeah. So so in the guardianship process. That the, the lawyers involved, the family members involved, the, the adult protective services, whatever agencies are involved, help determine, and, and all of the attorneys help determine who that named guardian should be. And if it's a, you know, if there's a family member who is willing to step up to accept that responsibility, they're almost always named. But but 
you don't, I mean, you're losing control that way where if you have a document completed, you know, you, you know, the people that you trust to make those decisions. Okay, I'm going to just follow up on that because that's interesting. Now, if you have your child, let's say uh, the person that's going to make the decision, something happens, they need to contact this person, they can't contact this person. So they wouldn't automatically go to the rest of the siblings. So it kind of depends on the situation. If something is urgent in the emergency room, they're going to do what they can to try and stabilize that person's situation. They're always going to err on the side of providing care versus withdrawing care. So, so they're always going to try their best to try and save a person's life. It's the withdrawing of care that we need a decision maker for. So getting back to my question, yep. then, so again, then it would have to go to guardian even though the children would be there and they're not named? So, so in certain situations, like in the emergency room, in the intensive care, when things are very imminent, say a very massive stroke and somebody is not doing well at all, and if all pertinent parties are in agreement, they can withdraw care. But if there's any disagreement within, then the court is, we, we do pursue guardianships. I've had a number of those cases in my career. Okay. Yeah. And the, the um, power of attorney for healthcare isn't only for end of life. It's if you get in a car accident and you're not able to talk, if you have a stroke that you can re you're not able to talk but you recover from, it can they can be activated and then deactivated. deactivated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have that situation all the time too. People they have something sudden happen, as Jennifer uh, alluded to, a, a stroke. Right in the in the midst of it, people are very confused, they're semi-paralyzed. They may need to go to a nursing home for a period of time to recover and gain some of that back. And three months later, they have improved. They've gone back to their previous baseline or improved status. They can now communicate one perfect. So it, we need two providers to determine somebody to be incapacitated. We only need one provider that says they're doing good and they can go back and take make their own decisions again. So it's not... Once it's activated, doesn't mean it's permanently activated. It can be changed, but it, it requires evaluation to make sure that the person has the cognitive ability to understand and, and make decisions. Mm -hmm. You said a guardianship to set one up is time consuming. Are you talking days, weeks, a months? It can be months. So a person could be suffering the whole time while they're setting up something who can make a decision? At times. Mm -hmm. Which and, is, oh, go ahead. Which is why doing these power are training so health important. care forms are so important. And I just want to add that anyone 18 and above should have a power training for health care in place. I actually was going to state that, and I was told that a long time ago, the best thing you can give your child at 18 is a power of attorney. <laughs> and it truly is, because just because I was their mother, if they were in a car accident, like you said, they're 18. I would have to go to court. And I just went to court for guardianship with my mother, and it was horrendous for, for different reasons. But my point is, I'm so with you, Jennifer, is that every 18-year-old and above should have a power of attorney because just because you're the parent does not mean you can make decisions for them. They're a legal, they're a legal adult. So we actually, a little side note, which is kind of funny, we went at one, one of my son's baseball games. Us parents who didn't have them all sat around and all witnessed, and then we had all the boys, the whole team, go around and we all witnessed, and everyone has their power of attorney. Wow. It's beautiful. Can I just say one other quick thing about guardianships and guardians? So like Colette was saying, if you pick your agent, you've talked to your agent about your wishes, your beliefs, all those things that Colette had on the screen. Which, were you going to talk about that next? Mm -hmm. You were? Should I be quiet? No. Okay. <laughs> A guardian 
if Colette is my court appointed guardian, she has to do what's in my best interest, not what my wishes are. Those are two very different things. Tell them to handle your money. If she's, oh, I'm sorry, Pat. So if if I have a if I'm in if I'm not able to make my decisions and I haven't filled out one of these forms, and I have and they've gone to court and Colette is now my court appointed guardian, she has to do what's in my best interest, not what my wishes are. Okay. Because I don't know her. I never met her before. And now she's incapacitated. And I have to try and figure out what's best for her. Instead of when I'm able to make my own decisions, I pick my sister, Jennifer, who has the same beliefs that I do and knows what my wishes are. She better still act on my, in my best interest <laughs> and what my wishes are. Sorry, Colette, I'll be quiet now. No. <laughs> These are all really good points, and I would much rather address the questions as they come up throughout the presentation than lose, lose that thought. So this was really stimulating conversation. So up on the slide are just other points to consider. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so my mom has a healthcare thing, and my dad was the first one who's passed, so then I was the second one. So now I'm the only one, and she has Alzheimer's. So I'm thinking I'm going to have to activate it fairly soon. So I should probably help add my brother. Or so so it, if him. if her document has not yet been activated, and you think it would be important to have an alternate named, you if you've got a window of opportunity, now would be the time to do it, just in case anything happens to you that would avoid the guardianship. Yeah, but there. Would I have to do a new document then? Or mm -hmm. Yep, you can't alter a previously okay. completed document because then you're adding somebody that's not on there. Okay. Yep. And if you don't do it now, she becomes incapacitated. You can't. It. Then it and has to be guardianship. You can't change it. Does guardianship happen a lot? More than it should. Mm -hmm. Well, didn't we look at those statistics that 70% of people think they should have a document, but only 23% have them? So there's 75% of people that things come up and there's no document and guardianship needs to be pursued. And it's costly. It can be three to $5,000 or more, depending on, on the attorney and the court process. So who pays for that? You, you. Your estate does? The, you do. The, the sick person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, if the person that's incapacitated and has lots of money, it's going to cost lots of money for that guardianship. I think it's 10% of the, the total, yeah. the total, the person's total assets. And these are free. <laughs> yeah. I like free. Yes. I like free. And this gives you control. This gives you control over who you want and how you and, and a guide for how you want them to make decisions. Just to follow up on your point. So mm -hmm. how does that work where you can you can dictate a price versus the person's wealth versus you're doing the same thing for a poor person and a rich person except you're Charging 10 times as much to the rich person. So so someone that doesn't have any money actually um, it goes through social services. Well, I guess not even no money, but, you know, just yeah. relative yeah. versus. I don't, I don't yeah. make the rules. Yeah, no. So, <laughs> but I need to but, set that up. It's based on your yeah. net worths. Yes. And well, then and I think that could be because if I have no money, guardianship is going to be pretty easy. You know, where if you have a lot of assets, a lot of people, a lot of, you know what I mean? The, yeah. the more, the more typically, the more you have, the more complex things might be in order to sort it out, I would say. Like that, well, I didn't that. know that. Yeah. I didn't know that until you just yeah. said that. So but I yeah. just thought it depended on the attorney you hired. Well, well, it's 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 attorney attorney just like she too. said, but if that's your assets probate. shouldn't, yeah. Oh, probate. When you, when you, when you go through pro. So in Oneida County, I don't, is Vilas County the same way? I am not going to speak on Vilas County. No. <laughs> I did not know. Okay, I did not so know. So in, in, in Oneida, um, all of the guardianships go through the probate office. Okay. Really? So you have to fill out all these forms with what 
what the assets are and, and all of these things. The answer yeah. to that is yes, Violet. They go through probate and Violet. Because as a guardian, you have to, if you're a guardian of the estate, which is a little bit different of the person, you have to report to the court how every penny mm -hmm. of right. that person has been yeah. spent every year. We've been, been involved in that, yeah. The so, great thing is, because we're all here, these ladies should not have to deal with any of us in guardianship. Yay! <laughs> 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 because we're all we're the family. Sure we have something <laughs> written down. But just that asset, the assets make a difference. I yep. have never yep. thought that. You know, it's just it's a, who, who the lawyer charges, you know, yep. what he charges or she. And so okay. while our talk today is primarily on health care power of attorney, you should also have a financial or durable power of attorney. And that deals with the financial aspects and business matters of not just paying bills and, and having access to the bank, but working with the insurances and applying for benefits and dealing with the VA or you know all of these other entities a durable or financial power of attorney gives you authority to do that. And I used to think as long as you were married and everything was in your joint account, that didn't matter. But I had a situation where I had one, they, they had extra property that they were trying to sell and one spouse had dementia and there, no notary would, would witness a signature because it was very clear that that person did not understand. And they ended up having to go to court to get guardianship in order to sell that property. So I do recommend that everybody have um, financial paperwork too. Well, and that leads into our next session. The next, the part three of this is exactly what she just touched on, the financial side of a lot of it. Maybe that'll wait till next time then, but I was just going to ask when you say, you were saying that there was one person that had that, and then, so if one, one spouse is the POA of the other, should all like accounts be changed? Should that name be taken off? That no. will be next time. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's a good question. I am a healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> they know all of those other rules about that stuff. Because but but it there it's there's nothing black and white in every situation. There's some gray area that you probably need specific um, specific advice on. You know, the experts. Because depending on how accounts are, because I just went through this with my mother and how they're set up, but we'll do it next time. Mm -hmm. Is the legal way to do it. And then another thing to know, as Colette mentioned about the take the document out for incapacitated, on the financial side of the durable, once it's created, you don't need it activated. You can actually go ahead and just That all depends on how it's written. Yeah. Okay. That is not, yep. It depends on how it's written and the verbiage. And so some verbiage says that this document becomes effective immediately upon signing. Some documents require incapacitation, but they don't accept the healthcare incapacitation because that one says that the person can't make healthcare decisions, and so they need a financial incapacitation. So it all depends on the verbiage of the the financial document. But that's next time. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to get back to healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we got off track. That's okay, but the, it's stimulating conversation. So, what if you had a sudden traumatic accident and um, you were, the ambulance came and took care of you, they stabilized you, you went to a major tertiary hospital, that you've had surgery, you've had everything done, and now you're hooked up to machines and tubes and things, and the family or the family's gathering and the providers are saying, we don't think things are improving. What, what and how would you want your family to make decisions in that tragic situation? I don't have an answer for that. That's the question for you to ponder and think about as you look at these documents because some of the documents are more comprehensive in exploring those than other ones. And that's where we. Oh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Power attorney for healthcare. If the main person that's got it is the healthcare agent, can they um, 
like in that, and then the patient is in hospice. Can that healthcare agent legally say, Ms. Hospice worker, you cannot talk to my siblings about our our mother? Okay, is that oh. is that is that power? Is that gives again a power of attorney? So it gives that rule to hospice? I, I don't know that we can speak to that specific situation. Um, the, the healthcare agent has the authority to make decisions for the best interest for arranging medical care. I don't know, I don't know about that ability to limit visitations. But that would have to be a, a kind of side discussion. To, it again to discuss depends further. on what are the advanced directives and the way they're written. And, yep. and truly, yep. what is that person's wish? Because we've had it both ways in hospice. We've mm -hmm. had it where it is specifically written down that the person who is receiving the services only wants all communications to go through this person, and we have to honor that. And then other times it's typically they may be the activated, but they're the ones then that say, oh my gosh, would you please let all the kids know I don't want to deal with it. So it really is case by case situation yeah. and what paperwork is prepared. There's attorneys that have done it very specific and then very vague. So the answer is depends. <laughs> Every situation is a little different. Yeah. So when we think about your answer to this, keep in mind what that living well means to you that we talked about earlier in the presentation. What, what is a good day for you? What brings you meaning and pleasure? One of the documents that we used a few years ago, there was a page that actually said, what level of disability would you be willing to live with and what would you not? And people would write, I don't wanna be in a wheelchair. I'm like, okay, there are people who live very full, complete lives with a lot of disabilities. I think what we think we couldn't do, we have more inner strength than we ever give ourselves credit for. And we don't always know until we're tested, but we can usually do a whole lot more. So I'm so glad that we've gotten rid of that particular question because I, don't, I think it was unfair and people really weren't thinking about it. But what does living well mean for you? And, and Explain that to the to your people. Um, I know a lot of people will say, um, "Here, we're going to get back get to that." Um, I don't want to be a burden to my family. I hear that all the time. Um, I don't want to be in pain. Um, I want to be aware of things. I don't want to lose that capability of understanding and and be. I, I, years and years ago, I actually did hospice care. I'm really dating myself. And I had a, um, a veteran who absolutely was in tremendous pain, had significant widespread cancer, tremendous pain, who absolutely refused pain medication because he did not want to be, um, have any of his senses dulled because of the post-traumatic experiences um, through his military. It was a really difficult situation, but that was important to him. Don't medicate me. Um, I get a lot of people who say, I want, I want the cat and dog to be able to climb in my bed with me. That's really important. So it's important to talk to your agent about what you expect from them. I have a lot of people who, oh, go ahead. You were saying before about uh, having to have someone be your, your named person but then if they got better, they could go back on their own making their judgments. Mm -hmm. So now we're in a situation where you're saying in uh, that scenario that, okay, you're, looks, this doesn't look good. You know, you're kind of on your way out. So many times you see people in comas and whatever, all of a sudden one day they wake up and they're just like they were 20, you know. Mm -hmm. Those miracles is do that happen. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that, can that be then reversed what that agreement that you're not doing anything for me now i'm talking to you what happens then so if if you wake up and you're now able to make your own decisions then of course they're gonna they're gonna honor that person's newly stated wishes and that that does happen so, that's for sure. so, they've been, the, so nothing is carved in stone and permanent it's fluid 
with the patient's cognitive abilities to make and understand decisions. Is there decisions. cognitive that it resumes mm -hmm. back to that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm getting confused. Is, yeah, is there a difference between living will and healthcare power of attorney? Yes. Or is it the same yeah. thing? No. A living will is a, a document that's often called a declaration to physicians as well. And that's a document that sp specifies specifically, if I'm in a terminal condition or have a persistent vegetative state, this is the, the what I would or would not want done. There's three questions on that document. Talks about feeding tubes and a couple other things, um, withdrawing support. Um, but that just says these are what my wishes are in these two situations, if I'm terminal or have a persistent vegetative state. The power of attorney for healthcare carries more weight because you're actually naming a person to make decisions and granting them all healthcare related decisions. So you need one of each? You can. Um, you, the, the declaration of physicians, the living will is there but it doesn't carry the same weight, we, we recommend for sure that you have the power of attorney for healthcare. Yes. What if the person you have listed as your POA for healthcare, <clears throat> pardon me please, is not able to be contacted at the time of so if, if, if measures are, are made to try and reach that person and they're just not available, not available, not, not returning calls, they, we will defer to the alternate agent. Okay. The reason I ask is because my daughter and son-in-law are going on six-week hike in Canada. Oh. <laughs> and that, that's what I yeah. So, so I mean, but you're still alert and decisional, making your own decisions. So, hopefully, in the time that they're gone on their six weeks, that there's nothing happens to you. But, but yeah, I mean, there are times that we have an activated document. We have a primary healthcare agent, and they're just not responsive. And we we have to make genuine efforts to try and reach them to give them a chance to fulfill their responsibility. And if, if they don't, and the person's health becomes in jeopardy, we involve social services. And then sometimes then we, we, because we have to, that person then would have to relinquish that responsibility mm -hmm. and say, I don't want it. And then we can easily defer to the other person, but sometimes we have to involve social services to help clarify those situations. Or I, I think, I don't think that they would ignore us, but if they couldn't be reached because they're Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, the VA should have a copy as well. For mm -hmm. what reason? If you go there for your own for your health care, they should oh, have a copy. Only if you. Yep. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, tell your agents how you feel about things. What you expect from them. So we've kind of talked we've talked about this whole guardianship and what happens if you don't have a document. Here's a the, the difference between the living will and the power of attorney for health care. And here's a little bit of the difference between a power of attorney and guardian. Um, so the power of attorney for health care document by Wisconsin um, statute covers certain authorities. One includes the authority to admit to a nursing home or a community-based residential facility for um, more than long-term. And how I describe that when I'm talking with people is like, if you need care that cannot be managed at home, by marking yes on this box does not say put me in a home. It just says, I want my people that I trust to have the full authority to make any and all decisions for me, to put, put in a, a facility if that's needed or not, but it grants all authority for that agent. Yeah. I have a lot of people who say, no way, I don't want to go to a home, I'm checking no. So that limits your agent's authority 
which then requires guardianship, protective placement, court involvement. Doesn't mean that you won't go to a home because if you need to go to a facility, you have to go to a facility. It just limits your authority and now we're to the guardianship route at added expense. So if a guardian can't admit to nursing home, maybe you just said it and I didn't understand it. So how does that person get to a nursing home then? Because then there's additional court papers that have to be done with a document called protective placement and the judge says this person has to be placed. So the judge makes the decision. Okay. And all of the legal people involved. Because, you know, everybody wants to be at home, which that's me too. Um, and with the ADRC, our job is to try to keep you at home as long as possible. But sometimes it gets to a point where you're just, no matter what, you're just not safe, where you need 24-7 care, which can't be provided at home unless if you have the, the funds to pay for that yourself. Or that there's agencies that have the staffing exactly. that can support that, <laughs> exactly. That's which is our big crisis for the So where is that call <laughs> <laughs> We're all moving there. <laughs> okay. um, but you... Never mind, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> that's, those of you who were here last time, that's what you kind of talked about. What I noticed, let's say, with my mother-in-law or certain age of people when I'm talking, they have one mental thought in their mind about a facility, right? It's mm -hmm. like it, it's like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. If you ever saw that movie, that's what it is. It's the psych units. Don't put me there. So by having the conversation with what are the different types of 24-hour care, you can't have it at home, which they went over last week about the assisted livings. And there's different levels of assisted living versus just a nursing home. Maybe you have to go to a nursing home, like Colette said, if you have a stroke. That's not a bad thing. It's a nursing home, but it's also a rehab, right? Then you can go home and da da da. So it's that education of really, you know, I mean, when we first did this with my parents, they're like, absolutely, do not put me in one of those things ever. And then we talked about what they were. Oh, that's what it is. So. And a lot of them are home-like. They're smaller facilities. They're, they're not institutions. Mm -hmm. Some of the buildings are still old and institution-like, and they've tried to modernize, but they're not the nursing homes of your youth, mm -hmm. our youth. But there's so many restrictions as to who they will accept. Yes. Yep. yep. Yes. That's they're, the importance of looking now mm -hmm. and us. Is that isn't going to change whether they'll accept you or not. So right now, nursing homes, it's very hard to find places for people to place them because there is such a shortage of workers. So nursing homes aren't going to admit more patients than they have staff to take care of. Or people with challenging care needs. That's, that's what I'm talking about. And, and we do have to send people farther and farther from the area because we don't have the resources here, but that's a, that's a nationwide crisis. It's not just unique to the Northwoods. Yes. So do you have, um, as a resource um, at the clinic, I know that the, some of the ADRC has this, but do you have facilities in the area that say, okay, this nursing home will take mental health, this one will take um, disabilities, this one will take dementia. Uh, do you have that? The resources that I give out are theirs. Yeah, okay. But I also defer to the wisconsin.gov website for listing too, because we have a lot of people, you know, we are lacking resources and this is a wonderful place to, re to, to retire. It's a terrible place to get old and sick. We just don't have, I mean, we just don't have the resources. So almost a year now, I've been telling people, if you have family elsewhere in the state, you might want to think about relocating so you're closer to family instead of out on some isolated lake road living by yourself, especially in the winter. And so we are having people relocating, and I go to the Wisconsin.gov website a lot to help them find facilities that are closer to where they live. Yes. Uh, in the ADCR booklet, 
Um, there's ads in there, both the violet, oh, I don't know about the violet, the Oneida County. There's ads in there about home health care. Um, and I put a call into three of them, and it's been almost a week, and I don't even get a call back. Mm -hmm. um, that's one issue. The second issue, if I were to get somebody to call me back, my question to them is, do they accept Medicare payments, or are they all private pay in, uh, agencies? Um, they're private pay, or if you have long-term care insurance. Oh, or if you're a veteran, some of the veteran benefits, depending on what your availability is. Okay. So Medicare will pay for services that require a degree behind your name, a skilled nurse to do wound care or teach on a new diagnosis, physical therapy to do rehabilitation to help somebody recover after an illness, things like bathing, personal care, toileting, making sure that they're fed, that they're getting their medicines. Insurance views that as custodial care, and they don't pay. And Medicaid, too. Does Medicaid... Look Medicaid is a different beast. Okay. <laughs> Medicaid has certain programs that does pay for those services, and that's their expertise. That's, that's Amy and I. That's okay. Who talk to. And I will, I will say, I in the last two weeks, I've called every in-home support agency in Vilas and Oneida County, and all but one... Have a waiting list because of the of the shortage of workers and the and the high retirement population that we have up here and, and the people who need the help the limitations on facility beds things like that it, it we all admit it's a crisis we we feel your pain we definitely do so to follow up on that the agencies that are in the book you know you said make sure that they have medications and stuff. Are they qualified? It depends on the facility. So why don't we ask yep. the, you two, the you two ladies, after we're done today, we'll have a conversation, either Jennifer and I. Because they're the expertise. Because I'm here to, to talk about the yeah. document. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank no, no, that's quite all right. That's quite all right. So I think we've already covered most of this, too, this, this whole guardianship mess, and hopefully we can avoid that. So next steps. We encourage, if you already have, which most of you already have a completed document, review what you have. Make sure it's current. Make sure that your agents have a copy. It should not be tucked away in a uh, safety deposit box. It needs to be reachable. Make sure your provider has a copy of it. If it doesn't say what you want and you're looking at some of the samples of updated documents that we have, we're all here to help help you complete or go over the document. Um, and I also have some, some booklets and information on things to talk about with your agent. You may have certain diagnoses, but we don't have that magic crystal ball. So we don't know what, what might be in the future. So that's why I said anything that happens to people that you know, movies that you watch, what are your thoughts? Have you ever thought about dialysis, cancer treatment? you know, heart surgery, <clears throat> though, even though that might not be something that you're currently dealing with, it's important to kind of talk about that so your people know what your thoughts are. So get a document completed, review it. There's people around that can help you facilitate through it. Yes? Can I ask your opinion of getting these documents created on legal Zoom? Um, I don't know that the documents on legal Zoom are the actual legal documents approved by the state of Wisconsin. I think that's the key is the state of Wisconsin. So every state is different. But I think they, they do give you documents that are accepted by your state because you have to tell them what state you're in. I, I can't speak to that. I go to the state of Wisconsin or the ones through my health organization. Legal Zoom, I, I can't speak to the um, authenticity of the document that they, that they put there. And I do believe you have to pay for that, and ours are free. <laughs> and and if, you, if you put up power of attorney for health care, um, wisconsin.gov, it will give you the actual state document, which we have samples of here today, too. 
The state document is very limited. It covers the three required con uh, questions for the state of Wisconsin. Um, the nursing home question uh, about authority for nursing home admission, authority to make decisions regarding uh, feeding tubes, and then healthcare decisions during pregnancy. Those are the three required questions by the state of Wisconsin. The other documents, we have a, a Spirus document and we have a Marshfield Clinic. Both the Spirus and Marshfield Clinic um, lean towards a, this caring conversation, um, honoring choices kind of um, uh, topic. So there's additional questions that help define what your specific wishes and desires might be. So they're more comprehensive than the state of Wisconsin document. There's no right or wrong document. That's why we give you samples. It's important on what, so it's important that you reflect on what your values are and that you complete a document as, as fully uh, and comprehensive as works for you. The other important thing about completing um, the, the legal part of the document is that your signature needs to be witnessed by two people who are watching you sign the document at the same time that you sign it. Those two people, there are specific rules on who they can or can't be. And it's, it is listed under the signing part of the document. The approved witnesses are people that are not related to you by blood or marriage. So no in-laws, they can't witness. Um, the agents can't witness because you've named them, so there's conflict there. Um, in the healthcare setting, social workers and chaplains are exempt, so I can act as a witness, but none of my nursing colleagues or any other employee of the clinic can witness. I grab another visitor of the clinic, um, and then in the community, it could be your neighbors or good friends. They don't need to know the content of the document, they're just witnessing you signing your name. But we do we do have to review the witnessing to make sure, I just came across one not too long ago that the, the one of the witnesses had the same last name and address as one of the agents and it turned out that it was an in-law. And so fortunately we, we had a window of opportunity before activating that power of attorney so we could correct that, but we don't always have that, uh, that window of opportunity. It was an invalid document and we have to pursue guardianship. Did you say they can't be related to the person or either any of the agents? Is that, or just the, the person that- Well, this, this particular agent was a daughter, so oh. it, it was an in-law. I would, I would stay away from the agents um, their names too, because there is potential of conflict. So be, if you do this on your own, which you're entitled to do, make sure you read the document because like I said, people, they look at that nursing home, they say, no, I don't want nursing home. So they check the no box. And that, that has nothing to do with the decision. It has everything to do with the authority that your agent has been granted. And then watch the signing. Those are the, the issues that we come up with invalid documents all the time. Review them periodically. Just because it's done doesn't mean it's done. Um, we talked about the demographic updates. Um, every decade, when you've been, if there's been a death or a oh, divorce. If there's a divorce and you've named your spouse as your healthcare <laughs> agent, that document is automatically null and void. Mm -hmm. oh. So don't get divorced, or if you do, as part of your agreement or your next step is to complete a new document. Um, anytime there's a new healthcare diagnosis or if there's significant declines, these are all reasons to review your document. And by doing this, and having these conversations, making sure that, that you have your ducks in a row, there is significant peace of mind. These are tough things to think about and talk about. Nobody wants to talk about the end of their life, but I have most people that I work with, boy, this, this just feels good to have it done. Personal story, it took me seven years to talk my dad into getting a document done. 
Again, they lived in Minnesota. He says, I'm sure that the people that you work with appreciate your social work skills, but keep it in Wisconsin. (laughs) We had a very good relationship. (laughs) But then he had a heart attack and he goes, I guess I should probably get this done. We did it and he goes, well, that wasn't so bad. I'm like, well, what did you think it was gonna be, right? But people are really afraid. They're, They're afraid of talking about it. They're afraid of what it means. They're, they, you know, there's a lot of fear. So I applaud all of you for being here, that most of you already have this done. So again, we're preaching to the choir. This, you're awesome. Thank you for attending. Colette, thank you again so much. We really appreciate you being here. Um, Lots of great questions. I love it. Um, We are going to hang out, so if you have some questions you want to ask us privately, we can do that. Um, Colette has the Marshfield Clinic documents. We have the state documents. We have the Aspirus Clinic documents here. So if you want to grab some of those to look at, you can. Jennifer has something else. This is called the gift to your family. I don't have enough for everyone. So if you came with two of you and you only can you only grab one, there is a document in the back that you could photocopy. But this, it's some really good information, commonly asked questions, um, talks about who should be your healthcare agent, uh, talks about organ and tissue donation, which is also on the healthcare power of attorney form, gives you instructions, and there's also an addendum, which I think that's the one that has that that question: What level of disability would you be living? Oh, really? really? Yeah. yeah. The last so, question there. <laughs> right before the signature, towards the bottom, that's it. Let's see. Okay, while you're looking for that, there's just a couple other things. Um, we have some evaluation forms. So if you could just take two minutes, Chris is printing them out. If you could just hang out for a minute and fill out those evaluation forms, that would be great. Our next presentation is on August 3rd, and it's going to be about more about finances. So if you're interested, sign up for that one. If you want a copy of Colette's PowerPoint, she's given me permission to send that to you. I can send it either email or snail mail. Just go ahead and put that information on here. Yes, Sue. Amy, um, Jim and I know that we need to update our forms. So if we take them and take them home and and do them, if we bring them next time, will there be with Qualified witnesses here to do that? Um, Jennifer will be here, so that's one witness, and we can maybe grab and, and somebody any else. Other Technically, anybody yeah. else that isn't related oh, to gosh, you yeah. oh, could. Okay. Okay. But if you want someone to look it over first yeah. before yeah. you sign it, there will be people. Here. First, we were thinking.